President Lyndon B. Johnson keeps the United States active in the war in Vietnam. The government does its best to keep the country in the dark about the war through the administration's policy of candor. The war will be a short one, they claim. 1968 will prove them wrong. This is the year the United States will face a bloody and brutal offensive as more about the war hits home to a disenchanted populace. So it was pretty quiet where we were mostly, except for Tet 68, the end of January. And that's when all hell broke loose. As 1967 ends, North Vietnamese attacks throughout South Vietnam stretch Allied forces towards the demilitarized zone. Lok Ninh is attacked on October 29, 1967. Dak Tho on November 23, 1967. By mid-December, U.S. command turns sole defense over to the South Vietnamese's 5th Ranger Group. They are to be supported by the U.S.'s 2nd Battalion, 13th Artillery. The U.S. 2 Field Forces, a corps-like group made up of 39 battalions, under the command of Lieutenant General Frederick C. Weyand, is tasked with search and destroy of Viet Cong and North Vietnamese bases close to the Cambodian border. Weyand, a veteran of both World War II and the Korean War, is uneasy. Why aren't his soldiers encountering more enemy troops? Why is radio traffic surrounding Saigon greater than usual? Appealing to General Westmoreland, Weyand is allowed to call some of his forces back to the 29-mile Saigon Circle surrounding the city. Weyand, it will turn out, is prescient. January 21st, 1968. The Marine garrison at Khe San, remotely located in South Vietnam, has been fortified by General William Westmoreland of the U.S. Military Assistance Command in Vietnam. 6,000 Marines strong, Westmoreland fears Vietnamese forces will overtake the area to further strengthen their hold. On January 21st, the People's Army of North Vietnam strike with a bombardment of the base. 90% of the U.S. forces' artillery and mortar rounds are destroyed. 18 Marines are killed, with 40 wounded. President Johnson and General Westmoreland decide to hold the base and launch an offensive bombardment of the enemy forces near Quezon. This first attack lasts for two days. The base, with its outpost, blocked the main avenue of approach into eastern Quang Tri province. The desired solution to the problem, using air mobile assaults in strength, was not possible owing to lack of both personnel and aircraft. Had they been available, the weather would have complicated such an operation before March or April. Not to be overlooked was the possibility of drawing a major enemy force into a position where it could be decisively destroyed. Another consideration in the decision was that the defense of Khe San could be envisioned as a classic example of economy of force. It seemed certain that the two crack North Vietnamese Army divisions which might have been used elsewhere in the province, could be contained by one reinforced Marine regiment with a major assist from air and artillery strikes. In addition to these two divisions, two other enemy divisions, held in reserve by the enemy, were never committed because the situation failed to develop in the enemy's favor. General Westmoreland had but two choices, to stay and reinforce or get out 
chose to stay. The Tet Offensive was also placing a strain on the supplies used by U.S. forces, averaging 2,600 tons of supplies a day, not counting petroleum. An additional 1,000 tons will be required to launch a counteroffensive to Quezon. When the enemy opened his Tet Offensive, he placed an additional burden on the U.S. supply system, then extant in i corps and already strained to the breaking point. Colonel Daniel F. Munster, a logistics officer for the Military Assistance Command Vietnam, determined the amount of supplies his units consumed each day and realized that he must have additional tonnage to reconstitute stocks and to build up for the counteroffensive to relieve Khe Sanh, which was tentatively planned to begin on the 1st of April, 1968. As the focus is kept on the Marine garrison in Khe Sanh, Viet Cong and North Vietnamese forces slowly gather in other areas of South Vietnam. January 30th, 1968. Meanwhile, 35 enemy battalions converge on Saigon with plans to take down six primary targets, ARVN HQ at Tan Son Nut Air Base, Independence Palace, the U.S. Embassy, the Long Bin Naval HQ, and the national radio station. Chillingly enough, this attack is part of a greater offensive staged by the combined forces of the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese, and one that will prove more psychologically damaging to American morale and faith in the war than anything else. Ho Chi Minh knows that America will not withdraw their forces or negotiate until forced to. The cover for both the North Vietnamese and Viet Cong forces to stage an offensive is that of a holiday. And uh, then all of a sudden, um, one night we were sitting around and we see all these rockets and mortars coming in and tracers going out up at the Marine base there in Quantry and didn't know what was going on. And then we heard about what happened in Way but the first air cab was down there, the Marines were there, and it was big battles there. And we're sitting like up on the hill in the middle. We don't know what's going on. We, we, Tet, what is Tet? The most important Vietnamese holiday, Tet, brings with it a truce from fighting. The Viet Cong and North Vietnamese forces exploit that, along with the diversion caused at Khe Sanh. Disguising themselves as peasants, Many of them infiltrate villages and cities under the appearances of holiday travel. At 0130 hours, a 15-man Viet Cong platoon attacks the Imperial Plaza in Saigon. They manage to infiltrate the grounds, only to have eight members killed by heavy fire. General Wayan, his fears confirmed by the rash of attacks, dispatches close to 5,000 American troops into action during the two hours from 0300 to 0500 hours. He appoints his deputy commander, Major General Keith Ware, in charge of the forces being sent in. Ware is a World War II battalion commander and Medal of Honor recipient. At 0200 hours, the ARVN Joint General Staff Compound is attacked by a Viet Cong battalion. They fail to break through on their first attack but are soon reinforced by two more of their own battalions. At 0400, a truckload of MPs rush to support the American officer's billet near the ARVN HQ, but are ambushed by Viet Cong Company. The two sides exchange fire in an alley for 12 hours, ending in the deaths of 16 MPs and the wounding of 21. The Viet Cong do manage to breach the ARVN compound by 0930 hours, but are driven out by South Vietnamese paratroopers. An explosion rocks the outer wall of the U.S. Embassy in Saigon at 0247 hours. It creates a four-foot hole that lets the Viet Cong terrorists, numbering 19, pour in and attack the compound. When the siege of the U.S. Embassy is over by 0900 hours, Four MPs and one Marine are dead. Only one Viet Cong soldier survives. 
the South Vietnamese paratroopers at the national radio station are not so lucky. They arrived earlier to reinforce it from suspected enemy attack and opt to sleep on the roof. It is a fatal mistake. Viet Cong troopers fire down from an adjacent apartment building and kill every paratrooper in their sleep. They take the station with ease and prepare to play a pre-recorded tape that will broadcast and announce their general uprising and fall of Saigon to communist forces. They are foiled when a crew at the 14-mile distant transmission site is signaled to break the link. Around 70,000 North Vietnamese and Viet Cong take up arms against over 100 South Vietnamese cities and towns. The most brutal of the Tet Offensive is within the ancient walls of a thriving city. The city of Hue, situated only 31 miles from the demilitarized zone and along the Perfume River, is a vital supply line for the Army of the Republic of Vietnam and the U.S. It also serves as a base for the U.S. Navy. In spite of its importance, Hue remains poorly fortified and defended. North Vietnamese forces begin their attack at 02.33 hours, taking the Tok Lok airfield, the ARVN headquarters, and U.S. Military Assistance Command Vietnam compound. The fighting is savage and bloody and ends with North Vietnamese soldiers raising the flag of the Viet Cong at 0800 hours. They will hold more than half the city, including the ancient walled citadel, for three weeks. As South Vietnamese forces attempt to quell the enemy, U.S. Marines from the 1st Battalion of Task Force X-Ray arrive from their base eight miles south of the city. The bloody and intense fighting rages for 26 days. Marines of the 1st and 5th Regiments are forced to fight house to house, retaking the city a block at a time. Yet still, Communist forces hold the Imperial Citadel and southern half of the city. The Marines are given permission by the South Vietnamese to use shells and artillery on the historic, ancient structure of the Citadel. It is February 29th when U.S. forces finally reclaim the Citadel and force the North Vietnamese out. The Citadel, the soldiers discover, is the site of a massacre. Entire classes of citizens, from intellectuals to religious leaders, have been taken from their homes by the Viet Cong and executed. Buried in mass graves, a total of nearly 2,800 bodies will be discovered over the next few years. It may be deemed a victory on paper, but with 80% of the city destroyed by Air Force airstrikes and the surviving civilians left homeless, it is Pyrrhic at best. Back in the United States, the media coverage of Hue reveals to the populace the effects of war firsthand. It is the turning point in the American public's perception of the war as the media brings it straight to their television screens. I was really disappointed because my dad was sending me newspapers uh, which would get there about a week after uh, uh, he had sent them. They would go and claim that, you know, uh, that units were completely wiped out when they weren't and uh, or uh, there was a battle and they would say that uh, three Americans were killed, but they also would fail to say that the, uh, 100 North Vietnamese were killed in that very same battle. And it was very one-sided, uh, basically supporting the North Vietnamese and uh, uh, biased to the fact that they were, you know, uh, implying that the North Vietnamese were winning the war when the opposite was true. Battles raged throughout South Vietnam. But Allied forces emerge victorious, with the North Vietnamese and Viet Cong forces decimated. The great decimation of the Viet Cong ranks creates an imbalance between the two communist allies, with the North Vietnamese gaining more power in the alliance. 
enemy forces lose thousands of men, 8,113, according to the Military Assistance Command Vietnam, while U.S. losses are 216 killed and 1,584 wounded, and the South Vietnamese, 452, with 2,123 wounded. A total of about 58,000 people are lost from all sides. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.